Here we go. Hey, everybody, Economic Ninja here. I hope you're doing great. We're going to talk about gold. We're going to talk about silver. And we're going to talk about why the banks don't want you to own it. That's right. Now, I had to bring on a special guest, and that is Andy Sheckman of Miles Franklin. Andy, how are you doing? I'm doing good, brother. It's great to see you and uh, looking really forward to seeing you in, uh, in a few weeks in Las Vegas. But I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Thank you. You're right. We are going to be in the same room. And to say that there's a lot of energy when you and I get into a room is a understatement. Is that correct? <laughs> yeah, well, definitely when you're in a room, I try my best to keep up with you, but it's infectious and it's contagious. So it brings out the best in me too. Yeah, for sure. Well, I, I can't wait. So we're both going to be at the Silver Symposium in Las Vegas, uh, September 30th. Come, Go check it out. I'll throw a link down below. Well, uh, space is limited, but I will tell you this, you are about to meet some of your future best friends. That is an understatement. Every time me and Andy get together, and the last time we were together, well, no, we've been together a lot on, on the road, but uh, Dallas, Dallas was impressive because so many people, the energy in that room was pretty contagious. It was contagious. And it was also the part that I liked about it the most was that it was very spontaneous. There was nothing scripted. I remember you were writing things on the back of a cardboard uh, box and I went up there with with no script and and it it really was a a great event in that respect that it wasn't planned and it just flowed and we asked, a, answered people's questions I thought it was great yeah well you know hey we're gonna talk about gold and silver and this is on the heels of something that happened with my broker which works for you and has worked for you for I believe a couple of years an amazing relationship and uh, she loves working for your company Miles Franklin but a bank actually. It, fraud alert came out. A fraud alert. You, they, uh, someone was going to buy some some silver, and they were about to wire money to your company, and a fraud alert happened. And the bank actually contacted you. Now, is this normal? You know, it's not normal, but it's becoming normal. And you know, we said they spoke with my operations manager, who said to the bank, "Yeah, this is all legit. You can release the funds." And they said, "Well, we need to have it go through compliance." And the response back was, well, no, you don't. Why do you have to let it go through compliance? This is the client's wishes. Yeah. Well, we have to make sure that it goes through compliance. But we have seen, you know, we go back to the order that we did last year for $50 million. One of the two orders that we did of that size, it took the lady almost five days to get the money wired. And that's why she wanted us to tell the world about it, that, hey, it's one thing. It's very easy to write the bank a check for $50 million and have them take it gladly. It's another thing to get it out. And what we view as our money, remember we're unsecured general creditors to the bank. What we view as our money and our ability to get it is becoming much more difficult as these banks struggle with the mass exodus of deposits leaving in search of yield and of safety. So yeah, I think it, it is becoming normal and will become much more normal as well. Yeah, you know, so in this uh, uh, scenario, and I've got another one to bring up to you in a second, uh, the the person, the client of my broker uh, that was trying to make this happen, and the bank's going, whoa, this is fraud, it doesn't make sense, and your operations manager said, you can release it, this is a legit business, what kind of information do you want from us? And they're putting pressure on the person trying to send this, going, we don't trust it. And it's funny because I'm sure nobody involved at that bank that was involved in that transaction has ever bought gold or silver, uh, let alone uh, like ever thought about the future of monetary policy. But here they're putting pressure on that person actually emails me. My, my uh, broker calls me and goes, you're never going to believe this. I'm like, I just saw the email. And I tell the, the subscriber, I go, yeah, I, I work with this company all the time. I've bought uh, precious metals through them. I've used this broker. Uh, I don't know what to tell you. Actually, I end up even getting on the phone with the person. And it's just funny because that's only one story. I heard a story about, and, and let me know if you've seen this, where a bank stops and questions the person trying to wire and saying, how do you know this is a good time to buy gold and silver? Are you sure you know all of the benefits of gold and silver or like what can happen, the volatility of it? And I remember hearing the story and going, what in the heck right does a bank teller or a branch manager for that matter of fact, have to be able to tell you where to put your money? Like you said, it's not really yours at that point. No, I think that they've actually created some departments uh, or, or positions at these banks called client retention management because they are losing clients. They are losing deposits. It's a mass exodus. And, and it, this is not going to change. But you know, people need to remember that 
when these depositors leave, especially if we see large deposits leaving or many of them leaving, this is what got Silicon Valley Bank into trouble. Now, that was a bank run, but the premise is the same, that these banks are undercapitalized and over leveraged and their leverage with what they thought was good assets, that being mortgage backed securities and treasuries and 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 uh, uh, muni bonds and all of these things that have lost 50 or 60 percent of their value. And if they aren't capitalized enough with money in house in order to meet those deposits, they're forced to sell these assets at a loss, which really, really hurts them. So they're doing all they can to mitigate not only the speed in which the money gets out, but to take the bold step of pretending that there are parents or our guardians and looking out for our best interests. And my question is, at what point did any of these banks ever become that entity that we have asked for uh, their um, they're they're looking over our shoulder to make sure, look, if, if the client comes in and says, I'm a big boy, I'm a big girl, this is what I want to do. I have verified the, the wire instructions. This is where I want the money to go. Call the company. The company says the address is right and it still needs to go to compliance. There's something really wrong with this. And it isn't your money. It's their money. And they're making the determination when and how easily and if at all that money gets released, that, that to me is, is rather concerning and probably the beginning of a trend as more of this happens. Yeah, it's funny because, you know, Miles Franklin doesn't work with credit cards and certain forms of payment that cost eventually the consumer more money, which you'd have to raise your prices on your metals. Um, so really, you like to work in the ACL realm or the, the wiring realm because by and large, that saves the most money for the client, especially on large purchases, correct? We, we have just we are going to begin using credit cards, but why pay 4%? We don't even mark things up 4%. Yep. And when you're talking about an ounce of silver at 4%, you're adding a dollar or more to the price of the coin. So we acquiesced and that'll be coming soon. But yes, I would much rather use a wire uh, or an ACH. It's easier, it's quicker, um, and it's more straightforward and a better deal for the client. Here again, making the assumption that the money held in these accounts is easily uh, transmitted as it always was and always has been and always should be. I think it's re it's really symptomatic of a bigger problem. And that bigger problem is that the banks are in a panic about more and more deposits leaving. And, and when, you know, when was it the decision of these banks to tell us what we could and what we couldn't do or when we can and when we, sh we should or shouldn't move? They never say that about moving into uh to an S and P index fund or into a mutual fund or whatever it may be. And, and who gave them that authority to me, it, it's very concerning. And, and those banks, if they're going to that length to make it that difficult to move your money, you ought to think about moving all of it immediately, especially with, you know, what we saw from Moody's just yesterday where 10 banks were, were uh, downgraded and six more, including, Two banks that I have money in, U.S. Bank and Truist Bank. U.S. Bank is everywhere in Minneapolis, where I'm from. And when I moved down here to Delray Beach, the first place I went was to Truist Bank. And what do you know? They're both on the docket, along with four others, to possibly be downgraded. You're going to see more and more and more of this. And heaven forbid we see a bail-in, which should have happened a long time ago. These banks should not have been bailed out. That's part of the Dodd-Frank Act. We see a bank get bailed in and watch the craziness when people run to pull their money out and watch what happens then. So, yeah, I, I think this is something we're going to see a lot more of. Well, you know, while you were talking, I threw a, a, a chart of the M2 money supply just to remind everyone M2 money supply essentially uh, accounts for all cash, cashier's checks, savings accounts, money market funds, things like that. The, the really just tangible cash so you could grab real quick. And as you could see, this is a chart going back to 1955, and you could tell that M2, the savings rate spiked when a bunch of government stimulus hit people's bank accounts. But now we're seeing people pull out money. Now, this little section, and I'd like you to talk about this in a second, Andy, it went flatline during the uh, the years after the Great Recession, right? We've seen very little times, uh, like after the dot-com bust, where it dropped ever so little. But by and large, even during the 90s, the recession of 94, we saw it flatline. We've never see it, seen it drop. Now, the question is this, Andy, with this panic, like you said, this is the proof that you're talking about, people searching for yield, pulling money out of accounts, getting into higher yielding accounts. 
what is the resolve like of the average silver and gold investor right now, as opposed to what happened, you know, in 2015, 2016, when we saw all kinds of issues with Brexit, Greece, and all that kind of stuff, or maybe the uh, Great Recession? What is the difference today, if any, behind the uh, the mindset of the gold and silver investor? The difference is very stark, and that difference to me is that it's look, it's one thing for us to sit here and say. Stock market's overvalued and over leveraged and risky. The, the real estate market, the bond market, it's, 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 it's one thing to espouse economic theory and, and, and talk about how it could affect your investments. Uh, it, it's another thing altogether to say, hey, by the way, the money in the bank, well, it's not safe. And, and if they fail, the fact that these banks were bailed in or gobbled up by J.P. Morgan or, or Bank of California, which, by the way, J.P. Morgan was on the back end of that. I have a very good friend who's one of the top analysts at J.P. Morgan. He said he spent all week on that PacWest Bank of California deal himself in New York City. So the point of it is, is that these banks that have fallen already uh, have been gobbled up or, or uh, consolidated by, by J.P., or were bailed out by, by the, the FDIC, supposedly not at the cost or at the expense of the taxpayer, which is a bunch of malarkey. The bottom line is, is that they're supposed to be bailed in. That's what the Dodd-Frank law said. And when you see that happen, you will see, I believe, uh, a, a massive amount of anxiety, unlike anything anyone's ever seen. And that's what we're seeing now. People are saying, look, you know, I just, I don't feel safe with my money in the bank. And so gold and silver represent, I think, um, something outside the system that carries no counterparty risk. And that's really what it's all about. It's not about becoming wealthy. It's about keeping your wealth and removing the counterparty risk and the systemic nature of the problem. So it's a different mindset primarily altogether. And I think you see an event like, any of these regional banks failing and Janet says, no, no more bailout, no more consolidation. We're going to bail in. And people will understand what that means. It is law. The fact that it hasn't happened yet is only um, delaying the inevitable. And that inevitable will be a panic that where that M2 line will fall off a cliff. And I, I, I just think that um, we're not there yet. But yeah. that is the difference is that people are focusing not on their investments as much as they are their savings. And and the chance of losing that is is pushing them here. Yeah, they're losing it to, to inflation. And now they're going to be losing it in the future to bail-ins. Because remember, Janet Yellen in 2017 said, we will never see another banking crisis yeah. in our lifetime like we did in 08. Yeah, right. Well, and and uh, we, we know that that's not true. And look, uh, it's also worth mentioning that this isn't just related to the regional banks, the ones that carry all the 70% the of the commercial real estate loans of which a billion plus have to reset over the next 15 months. This is also about the commercial banks where the biggest money in the United States is rapidly pulling their money out of the commercial banks as well and going directly to uh, uh, treasurydirect.gov would be my guess or into precious metals or into things outside the banking system because Look, if you go directly to the treasury uh, and buy short-term duration treasuries, six-month treasuries, you're betting on the U.S. government. And if the U.S. government fails, well, the banks are in big trouble as, you know, as, as, as is right there. So to see the amount of money actually dwarf money coming out of the commercial banks are dwarfing what we're seeing coming out of the regional banks. And those people, I would argue, are a little bit more well-informed. So this is not just an issue of money leaving the regional banks. It's also the commercial banks. So there is strain across the entire system. And as rates keep rising, more strain and, and, and more problems. So again, I don't think this is an isolated deal. I don't think that this is something that we'll look at at the end of the year and say, geez, that, that, was, a, that was a scary deal. Good thing we got by it. I think it's just the very beginning and I expect to see much more. So look, if you're concerned about your money in, in the banks or, or have too much in one bank, be proactive and mitigate your exposure. Put Spread it around. And I've heard you say this before. Over several banks, go directly to the treasurydirect.gov and buy short-term treasuries. Buy precious metals. Do whatever it is you want to do and do it before it becomes very difficult to do. It's already getting tough.
Yeah, totally agree. Could not agree more. Listen, everybody, there's limited seats at the Silver Symposium. Me and Andy are going to literally rock the house with a handful of other amazing speakers. Go take a look at the tickets. Uh, it, it looks really cool. We're putting one ounce of silver in every single person's hand that buys a ticket. And the discount link's down below. Hope to see you guys there. And Andy, as again, as always, thank you so much for coming on the channel. Honor, honor is mine. And I look forward to picking up where we left off in Vegas. Right on. You're the man. And I'm going to put a, a phone number or contact info for my broker that works for Andy. And if you don't want to use uh, her, go ahead and check out Andy at uh, Miles Franklin. Have an awesome day, guys. We'll talk to you later. And Ninja, out.